If you have a Bible, I invite you to open to Ephesians chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can follow along in the bulletin or you can grab one of the pew Bibles in front of you. This way we're going to start in Ephesians chapter 2 as we continue going through this letter of Paul. We're going through the first half of Ephesians where God working through the Apostle Paul to remind us about the beauty and the wonder of God's grace for you in Jesus Christ. And the most amazing part about the first three chapters of Ephesians is that there's no commands. It's just God's grace upon you because of what Jesus has done. And so Paul spends all this time and all these wonderful big theological words reminding you and me of God's love for us in Jesus Christ, no matter who we are. And this morning, Paul's describing two people. He's describing those who are already, or at least in their minds, think, I'm already close to God, right? Like, I already have a relationship with God. I'm already near to Him. I know who He is. I, I follow the rules. He knows me. And he's also describing the other person in the world, which is the person who appears to be far from God. Maybe they've intentionally run from God, intentionally done things to defy Him, or maybe they just never have heard about Him. And so Paul is saying there's these two types of people in the world. There are those who are far from God and those who appear to be near or close to God. And the question that he wants us to wrestle with and to come to an answer about is this. Which of those two people is Jesus for? Now, because you're in church, and I'm leading you on, the answer that you're already saying is both, right? And that's the correct answer, right? Like, that, that's the whole point of this paragraph. It's the whole point of the sermon is that, that Jesus and his love is for both kinds of people. The reason, though, Paul has to talk about it so much is we don't usually live that way, right? That's the answer we give when we're in Sunday school or in church or whatever it might be. We're like, yeah, of course, Jesus for both. But if you look at how we live as human beings, Paul describes it as there's hostility, which means what? There's arrogance. There's judgment. There's condemnation saying, no, no, God is for these people and not those people. And both sides look at each other and think what? God, Jesus is for me, but not you. Right now, this plays out all the time in our world. We are very quick to have hostility towards each other. We're very quick to divide each other, put each other in different groups and camps and categories. And then what we like to do is say, okay, who is God for? And conveniently, every time I hear somebody making those arguments, guess who God always happens to be for? Themselves. They never look at it and go, well, you know, God's only for some people, and it's not me. It's always their group. Magical, right? It's just amazing that that always happens. And so Paul wants to address this attitude within our human nature that is always dividing ourselves. And now his answer is not, be nicer. Anybody ever get told that when you were a kid? You need to be nice to them, right? You need to be kinder to them. And how many of you, you just took that to heart and you're like, no problem, mom and dad. I'm going to be nicer. Anybody? Or how many of you are like, only when they're watching? And when they're not watching, it's World War III in our bedroom. Let's go, right? <laughs> we do this from the very time that we're born and, and small. We, we begin dividing ourselves. And the answer is usually be nicer, do better, be kinder. And, you know, those are good things. But we all know in our hearts it doesn't actually work. And that's the beauty of what Paul is going to talk about today. It's not a command of, and you need to go out, and you need to do better. You need to go out and be nicer. You need to be kinder. What he's going to talk about is the real answer to the hostility, the division that we create as humans, is Jesus and his grace for everybody. 
So he begins in verse 11, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you are at that time separated from Christ. So he's describing the two people and he's using these words that are sometimes unfamiliar to us. He's saying, look, there's these two groups of people. There's the people that have the old covenant through Abraham who have always known God and always claim we are close to God. We are near to God. God is close to us. And then there's these Gentiles who were pagans, who, who didn't have the Old Testament covenant, didn't have those promises. And he's saying, these are the two groups. There's the people that are close to God, very religious, very spiritual. And then there's the people that would be described as far from God or separated from Christ. And he's saying, I need you to remember that that was once you. That the only reason you and I are near to God is because of the grace of Christ in our lives. Not because you were like, I'm going to be a better person today. Like, I'm going I'm to put more effort into it. But because God has drawn you close to him by the grace of Jesus. And here's how he describes them in verse 12. He says at the end of verse 12, having no hope without God in the world. So he's saying here's the, here's the major human issue. Is that there are people in the world without God, and because of that, without hope. And when I look at a story in the Bible that you're familiar with to help you see how this plays out. So if you have a Bible, you're going to turn to the left, and you're going to open up to Luke chapter 15. It's a story that you are familiar with called the prodigal son. All right, that's usually what it's referred to, the parable of the prodigal son. And in this story, there are two people. One ends up being very close to the father, doing all the right things, obeying all the rules. And then there's another one who is out in the world without the father and without hope. All right? And you're going to see how Jesus in this parable describes what Paul is talking about on a human level. See, our gut instinct, if you are more on the religious side, you're a Christian, and you've been going to church for a while, is to lean towards the side that Paul talks about. Of, you're near to God. So what do you do? Well, there's hostility, right? Because we divide ourselves. You're like, oh no, but I'm a nice person. I know you are, but you're still a sinner. And so as we divide ourselves, guess what we do about the people out in the world that Paul just described as being without hope, without God? They look like the younger son in the parable, right? And what we do is we tell them, you need to do better, you need to get better, work harder, clean your act up, and then you can come home to the Father. And what Paul and Jesus talk about is that that's not how God's grace works. So we're going to look at this story. Luke chapter 15, verse 11. There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. Give me my inheritance. So he divided the property between them. Not many days later, the young son gathered all that he had and took a journey to, into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. So here is, from the religious person's viewpoint, right? From the good person, the older brother's viewpoint, that I obey all the rules, I'm reading my Bible, I'm doing what God has asked me, the worst possible person. That's what Jesus just described in the younger son. Worst possible person. They dislike the father, who by the way is God, not you. Okay? You're not the hero of the stories. It's God. Just to spoil the ending. Okay? He despises the father so much, he says, I'll take all the gifts and all the things that you'll give to me, but I want nothing to do with you. So I'll enjoy this life. I will live it up. I will get as much material things as I possibly can. 
And that's how I'm going to live. So that's how much he dislikes the Father. He wants nothing to do with God. And how does Jesus describe him, right? He leaves the Father to do what? Go to a faraway land. Go far and far away. How does Paul describe people? They are far from God. And he goes out and he lives with reckless living, which is a great way to describe all the things that we look at people when they're stuck in their sin and you and I look down on them in our arrogance, what do we do? Can't believe they would behave like that. Or if you've ever had the thought, well, of course he's with the pigs. He deserves it. Your actions have consequences. You, you reap what you sow. You deserve that muck. Right? And whatever it might be, everybody's got a category of people because Paul says, hey, we have this hostility between us. We have these divisions among us. So what do we do? You and I make a list of the type of people that we view as the younger son. And we think they deserve what they're getting. Of, they deserve the consequences of their actions. And so this is how the son young, and you have to understand also that in their cultural context, when Jesus says he's living with the pigs, he's eating with the pigs, we, we think, oh, that's kind of gross. But for them, it's beyond just kind of gross. It's also the most unclean you could possibly be. Meaning, you are, as this young man, as far as possible that you can get from the Father. And in their context and in their world, there was a million different rules and steps and ceremonies that go through in order to get back to the Father by being made clean before you could come into his house. So it's not just a, oh, well, that's kind of yucky, like he's rolling around the pigs and eating their food. Jesus is emphasizing for his audience this is the most unclean person you could possibly be. You can't get further from the Father than this young man. And everybody listening to this story would go, yeah, but we know what he needs to do in order to get back to the Father. He needs to follow this step and that role, and he needs to do all these different things. And before you go, oh, well, that's because, you know, they had the Old Testament, and they had Leviticus and all these rules and everything. You and I oftentimes behave the same way. We do. That's why Paul says that's the human problem, that there's hostility between these two groups. Now, you might not have the same list of ceremonial washings and rituals that a person has to go through, but every time you and I think, well, they deserve it, or you know what? <laughs> you need to behave better, you need to do better, and then you can come to church. If you ever thought that, or had that inkling in your heart, you're responding the exact same way the people listening to this parable were responding to the young man. Oh, I know what he needs to do, because here's what we think. <clears throat> Paul says there's a group that says they're far from God. They've got no hope. They're out in the world without him. There's this other group that thinks they're close to God. And we, by nature as humans, always think, what? Well, I'm one of the ones that is what? Close to God. If I was to do a survey, right? I'm not going to do it because that would be awkward. If I was to do a survey, most of us would say, yeah, I'm close to God. I love Jesus. I love the Lord, right? So there I am. Here's the problem. Is that there's still the hostility. And we're going to see it, how, how it plays out. Verse 17, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. Now I want you to hold on to this phrase, when he came to himself. Some translations say, he came to his senses, right? Ever heard the expression, you got to you hit rock bottom, and now, okay, we can build you back up, right? Hold on to that thought because it's going to make you feel even more guilty later on. It's important. Verse 18, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. 
And he arose and came to his father. All right, now, listen to how the young man describes himself. So I'm going to tell God, I'm, the father, I'm sorry, right? I'm going to confess my sin. I have sinned against you. He's a confessing. This is very good. And how does he describe himself? I'm never worthy to be what? Called your son again. Instead, just treat me like one of your servants. Now here is where it gets really tricky in our hearts. We think, oh, look at him. He's finally doing what we have been waiting for him to do. Hit rock bottom. Come to their senses, right? Turn, he's beginning to turn his life around. Finally, thank goodness. And then he says, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So don't make me your son. Don't call me your son. Treat me like one of your servants. What's he doing? He's rejecting his identity as the father's child. He's saying, I'm not good enough for that. So I'll be a second class citizen, but at least I'll still be in the house. And here's where it's tricky. We want to applaud and go, Oh, look, they came to their senses. They're doing the steps. They're going through the process of all the rules and rituals that we need for them to come back home. And look at this. They, they know they're so bad that they're just going to be a servant. What does that mean? I know you, you could come to church, but just at a distance. I mean, Jesus loves everyone. How many of you have memorized John 3.16? I have a theory. Here's my theory. That is the most loved Bible verse in the whole of scriptures. I also think it's the most disbelieved verse in the whole of scriptures. We love it. We absolutely love it. It's beautiful. It's true. It is the epitome of God's love. He loves the whole world. Meaning the older son who stayed was already close to God. And the younger son who went and made a mess of his own life with his own choices, his own decisions, right? His own sins. And we go, man, John 3.16 is great. Until what? The prodigal wants to come home and not just come home, but wants to be a son, not just a servant. So we can keep it at arm's length. Okay, you're in, but you're not as close as me. Right? We ever do that measuring contest? Who's closer to God? Who's the better Christian? And then we, oh, okay, you can stay there, but maybe not as close. This is the human condition that Paul is describing. Now, Paul says something in Ephesians 2. He says, they are without hope. So I want you to think about this young man. I want you to think about people in the world who have sin in their lives. Who've made a mess of it. Who aren't with God. You would just, like Paul says, there are people that are far from God. And when we look at the prodigal son, when we begin celebrating, oh see, he came to his senses. It's because we think the solution is better moral behavior. It's what we think. That's our natural instinct as humans. It's, we would just do better, perform better, live better, and then you could come home. Of course the Father loves you. He'll welcome you home. Right? We think, just like they did when the original telling of this story, yeah, there's all kinds of things he can do to get back home. Paul, though, says the problem for the prodigal is not moral failure. See, he doesn't have hope. He doesn't have God. So his answer is not, please perform better. His answer, his solution is what? You get hope and you get God. So we see a world of hurting people who are far from God, who look like the prodigal, the solution that you and I proclaim to them is not, 
You need to live like me. I mean, I've got problems, but they're not as bad as yours. Right? No, the solution is John 3, 16. Now, God loves you. Here is hope for you. Jesus, I asked you at the very beginning, and you all said, both. We'll put it into practice. Oh, Jesus is for you, even when you're far off. So the young man, he comes home. Verse 20, and he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you are no longer worthy to be called your son. So he gets his whole speech out. But it's after the father has already embraced him. The son didn't apologize. He didn't confess. He didn't make amends until after the father had already embraced him. Because the gospel and grace comes first. Because that's what he actually needs. And then he gets his confession out. In verse 22, though, but the father said to his servants, which means not to the son, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. So how does the father view the prodigal son? as a son, right? Did he get paid back all that money he squandered? Nope. Did he say, oh, okay, you can make it up to me by being a servant for a little while? No. The first description that the father has for him is what? This is my son. This is my child. And that is the grace of God. That's what John 3.16 looks like. Is God loves the whole world. And when Paul is describing those who are far off from God, he's saying, here's their problem. They're without hope. They're without God. The answer is not pay them back. Do better. Make up for all your misdeeds. The answer is simply be embraced by the Father and called his child. Now, they all celebrate, except for one character, right? <laughs> it's not where the story ends. Everybody else is celebrating, except for who? The one that Paul says is already near to God. We struggle with the gospel. We struggle with celebrating that it actually changes lives freely by God's grace. Because it's something inside of us. That's why Luther said that the gospel is the most foreign thing to us. Something inside of us says, you know, but I've been doing really good for a while. And I don't think it's fair that they get all of Jesus immediately. Because, I mean, look at me. I've been doing some good stuff for a while. I've been working hard. I've been faithful. Right? I've met people as a pastor who said, I've never had a moment in my life where I didn't know God. Faithfully worshiping, faithfully serving. That's amazing. But our inclination is to not join the celebration. And this is what happens to the older son. Verse 25, now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked to him what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. Now you think, you're like, well, that's a, let me join in the party, right? This is a time to celebrate and rejoice. And we know that's the answer, right? Like, that's what we should do, right? But it's not what we do, and it's not what the older brother does. Verse 28, he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. <laughs> I was like, no, no, you can join the party too. You can join the celebration of sinners being redeemed by grace. And instead, he stays outside. 
Verse 29, but he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. I've always loved the Lord. I've always been serving. Nobody even recognizes it. Nobody says thank you. Like, I just do it. I've been a good person. All these wonderful things. And now you're just going to give all your grace and all of your love and all the rewards of heaven to them as well? What's the older brother thinking? That's not fair. And he's right. It's not fair. It is absolutely the opposite of how the world works, right? And that's our problem with grace. <laughs> we love grace. It's, oh, it's so wonderful. God loves it, right? How many of you are Lutheran? You're like, yeah, I've heard grace about my whole life. It's what it's all about. I'm saved by his grace, right? Through faith in Jesus. And my seminary professors would always be like, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, because they're like just reciting the whole catechism to us. Okay, but we, we know the answer. We just don't always appreciate when it's applied to them. I don't like it when it's given to the prodigal. Right, the prodigal is whoever you define it to be, by the way. Jesus says, this is the most unclean, unworthy person in the world. And the Father says, welcome home. And our response oftentimes, as the older brother, is, I'm not going in there if they're in there. They don't deserve the same kind of party. They don't deserve the same kind of celebration and love. See, Paul uses these wonderful big words. He's like, oh, the hostility has divided us. We're like, oh, what is going on? And Jesus is like, here's what's going on. <laughs> Your heart is what's going on. And so he's, he's complaining. He's saying, look, I deserve more than him. Now here's me messing with you because of your good Lutheranism. As soon as we start going, no, but I deserve. Here's my question. I thought you believed in grace, which means I don't deserve it at all. And that's why at the very beginning of the paragraph, Paul says, I need you to remember something. You used to be one of the ones who are far from God until he brought you home by the grace of God. So the older son is outside complaining. Verse 30 is very important. But when this, what, son of yours, I'm not great at biology, but that's his brother, right? <laughs> like, Y'all are following that? And, I, and now what is he doing? He ain't my brother. Is that your son of yours? Now, I grew up, <laughs> my parents were divorced, and so they had to do discipline by long distance. <laughs> and sometimes my brother and I were not always the most well-behaved, sainted children in the world. And that's when you knew when you were in trouble, <clears throat> is when mom would call dad and be like, do you know what your children did? Do you know what your sons did today? <laughs> right, there's that little slight disowning <laughs> of just, and that's what this, this brother's doing. The hostility and the division is so great. He says, you call him your son, he's in the house, but he's not my brother. That's a lot of hostility. It's a lot of anger and hate and arrogance. And this is how he's describing his brother. He's like, it's this your son of yours who has devoured your property with prostitutes. You killed the fattened calf for him. So here's what the older son is doing. He's keeping records. All right? Let me tell you what I've done for you, God. That's, what he's, that's his first complaint. I've always been faithful. I've always obeyed your commands. I've always served you. I've never left. I've, all the good things I've done and Jesus, before you love him, I'm just going to remind you one more time of his sins. I'm not going to remind you of mine, because they're not that bad, and I've done enough good to make up for them. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to make sure, Jesus, in case you forgot, here are their sins. And here's the father's response. The father said to him, son, so how does the father view both people as his children? 
This is a messed up family that we now call the church. It's a collection of sinners and saints, of people who are far from God and people that think they're close to God, people that have squandered all the grace that God has given to them and people that think, I've always been perfect. And the father looks at both children, both of the brothers, and says what to them? You're my son. And looks at the older brother and says what to him? You're my son. You are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But it was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this brother was dead and is alive. He was lost, and he was found. Now notice the father reverses what the older brother had said. He doesn't say, and this second son of mine, he says, no, this your brother is reminding him, you may not feel it, you may be upset, but he's still your brother. And here's what this means for you and I, as Paul is talking in Ephesians 2 about this hostility. There's people that are far from God, those who are close from God. In verse 14 of Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says, For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. So he's saying, this is what Jesus has done. He brings both sons into the father's house. And he reminds both of them, you are brothers. He has made peace between us. He's gotten rid of all the hostility because you are not in the father's house as the older brother because you've been doing really well and really good things. That's why the father tells him, everything I have is already yours. I already gave it all to you. You're not going to earn more of God's love by doing more good things. You already have his love. And you're not going to get welcomed back into the house as a prodigal because you went through a bunch of ceremonial things and said, see how much better I'm doing now. You get welcomed into the Father's house because he brings you in by his grace and says, you're my son. And so Paul is saying, that's what Jesus has done for us as humans and as the church. He's gotten rid of the need for hostility because we're all in here by God's grace. Whether you were really far off and had an incredibly long journey to get home. Or you're like the older brother and you're like, I've always been here. Paul's saying, yeah, you're both there by God's grace. It's by Jesus Christ that you're in the house. He's the one who's given you peace. And he emphasizes this again in verse 17. says, he came and preached peace to you who are far off. And peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So I asked at the very beginning, who is Jesus for? And the answer, according to Paul, is both. Jesus came to bring peace to the prodigal. And say, all of your sins are forgiven. You are my child. Welcome home. And he came to bring peace and preach peace to the older brother. The person who said, I've always been here, I've always been in church, I've always known the Lord. To say, he's already given you all of his love and all of his grace. You, you, you can stop your striving. You can stop trying to do more to impress him. He's already given it all to you. He already loves you. So here's the beauty of God's grace. It's John 3, 16. God loves the whole world. He loves the prodigal who's like, oh, I'm far from God. And he loves the arrogant, hypocritical, judgmental older brother. And he looks at both and says, I am for you. My peace and my love and my grace is for you. Welcome to the Father's house. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for your grace. That it extends throughout the whole world to all people. Whether we are far off or near that you have given your love to us and that we have it fully and completely. May we be people who put down the dividing walls and simply celebrate the goodness of your grace for all people. And may we be the kind of people who proclaim and share that peace and love with the whole world.
In your name we pray. Amen.